Hello, my name is Helen Ives and I work in the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care System on the COVID-19 vaccination programme. Welcome to our recorded webinar for parents, carers and guardians of school aged children aged 12 and above. We have a selection of panellists today to provide you with some information. There is also further information available online and an email address to send in your questions. Our panellists today are Dr Derek Sanderman, Claire Curry, Jane Ansell, Dr Nigel Watson, Sarah Malcolm and Alison Critchley. I'd like to now hand over to Dr Derek Sanderman who will give you an overview of the COVID-19 response and the progress from the integrated care system. Thank you Derek. So welcome everyone and I just want to give a, a, a broad in introduction. I am the Chief Medical Officer for uh, the ICS. I thought I'd start thinking about the last 18 months. So much has happened. We've been on such a journey. Um, and there's so much that I perhaps could or should say. I just want to acknowledge for some it's been difficult. I think for all of us it has and continues to be. But others it's been really sad and frightening and recovery is going to take some time. And over this time, we've all learned so much. I don't think we would have chosen to become virologists, learning how respiratory viruses spread, airborne, large and small droplets landing on surfaces, staying in the air. Um, remember when we were unsure whether it was a good or a bad thing to wear masks, when uh, we weren't sure what to sing when washing our hands, uh, when you didn't know what PPE stood for or hadn't heard of an R number. And just really, uh, and the reason for saying all this, when we thought it was going to get back better, I think it's become more complicated. And now, um, and the po point of this talk or, or series of talks is you have to decide with your children whether they should get vaccinated. A decision that you're being asked to make uh, when the lead from the experts is um, complicated and less sure. So the JCVI, which are the experts on vaccination, concluded that although there was an overall benefit, and let's be clear that the benefits and risk uh, are great, greater on having COVID than having the vaccination, it was finely balanced. And that's simply because children are mercifully less affected by, by COVID. But then it went to the CMO, the sort of senior medical leaders within the uh, country who looked more widely and, and looked at the benefits related to well-being of children, schooling, mental health. And uh, they concluded that um, overall, if you take everything into account, we should be offering this uh, vaccination. But here it, ha it is your decision and, and as a group we're not here to tell you what to do. So the intention today and, and in any other information we give you is to try and provide the information for you to make this difficult decision possible and understand the, the conundrums. So you now need to, to not just be a virologist, you need to understand uh, a little bit how the body protects itself from infection. You need to become immunologists. So when a the body meets um, a new infection, it produces an army of chemicals which attack uh, the, the invader, chemicals that stimulate cells that uh, destroy viruses and, and infected cells. Um, this, this is just amazing, you know, it, it is really uh, uh, fantastically effective in keeping us alive through all the things we meet. And in the vaccination, it has been amazing, uh, particularly at preventing death or serious illness, and, and we all know that story. But the issue is it's not perfect. When this army is uh, mobilised, uh, it mobilises much more generally and in that it makes mistakes and it starts making um, uh, errors uh, and those are the side effects that we've heard about in the vaccination. And here is where you need to be balancing uh, the risk. And when considering those balances, we'll talk about risks of one in a million or one in a hundred thousand and they're really hard to, to, to understand. But simply to say, that they are tiny compared to the similar risks that one would see if you get the, the infection. The conundrum is that your children, if they get infected, are much more likely to have a, a, a benign course. They will be ill. It, it is a nasty disease, but they're less likely to come to harm uh, than those of us who get angry. And I sit here having just had my third vaccination and, and feel very privileged uh, to have it reflecting my age. But that's not the same for children. But what I want to say is that just do remember that if your children get uh, the, the vaccination, 
uh, they are protected. It reduces the risk about 50% for a single vaccination, much higher with the second vaccination. Um, uh, but it is not perfect, uh, but it certainly reduces the risk at the moment of uh, absence from school and those psychological impacts. So the CMOs looked at this and came to the conclusion that the risk was much better. But how how would you make that decision? And as I went through this personally, now my children are all um, adult and being vaccinated. My grandchildren are not yet old enough. But I've looked at what would I do? And I, I thought it might be more useful to say that I struggled with making this decision despite my knowledge and my ability to ask people. But I finally came clearly in my mind that I would, if I had to make that decision for my children, uh, I would say uh, get the vaccination. And so here I, I might explain why. I think that balance of risk is, is slight, but we can't predict the future, but the future is uncertain at the moment. And if the vaccine, con if the virus continues to change, continues to evolve, and becomes more dangerous and particularly more dangerous for our children, we'd want to be ready to be able to protect them quickly. And what we know is it takes a while for the vaccine to work um, and it takes uh, a while for us to get the children vaccinated. However, if you've had a single vaccine and we do decide because of the risk increases that we desperately need to get a second vaccine into our children, the virus has mutated to become more damaging. Having that shot in the arm uh, is really valuable. So for me, and I think all of us will make a personal decision, the weight of evidence is strongly in favour of uh, vaccination as you're older. It's less strongly um, in favour uh, when you're of this age. However, I personally would want my children protected so that they only required a second vaccination if the virus became more virulent. And that risk, I hope, is not going to happen, but exists. So I think I'm going to stop and, and hand over to experts who will give you more detail and try and explain that balance of, of risks uh, and just pass on to Claire Curry. Hi there. Good, 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 good morning all, or afternoon, <laughs> depending on when you're watching this. So I'm Claire Curry, consultant in public health, and I work at Portsmouth City Council. My role here today is to give you an overview of the current COVID picture. So critically, COVID has not gone away. The virus continues to circulate in our communities. That's the case across the country, as well as more locally in Hampshire, Southampton, Portsmouth and the Isle of Wight. The Delta variant, which is currently common, is highly infectious. Across the southeast of England, the rate of COVID cases in the last week or so has been approximately 300 per 100,000 people. And actually rates are a bit higher in the local patch that I've mentioned at the moment, um, but of course does vary across, across these areas. These are, to put that in, a bit into perspective, these are similar case rates to actually what we saw um, in the winter. We're currently in the third wave of high levels of infection, and there is expected to be further fluctuation in rates. Different age groups have experienced higher infection rates at various stages, during the previous wave. And currently rates are high in secondary school aged children. Certainly in Portsmouth and is reflected across the country, rates in school aged children are several times higher than rates for the overall population. And at the moment, rates are remaining low in the over 60 or that older population. Generally speaking, the risk of severe illness reduced with age and therefore, while the pressure on hospitals has reduced, there are still substantial risks from COVID to our local communities, including working and school days being lost, individuals experiencing long COVID or lasting symptoms following infection, and risk of severe illness in individuals who are unvaccinated, particularly older adults or individuals with underlying health conditions. Vaccination, as we know, is and has been a key control measure in the pandemic so far. However, there are some things that we don't fully understand. For instance, while COVID vaccination does reduce infection being passed from one person to another overall, we don't fully understand how effectively vaccines do this. The initial phase of the vaccination programme invites individuals in the most vulnerable groups to take up the offer of vaccination. Monitoring the impact of the vaccination programme has shown that it's had a big impact on reducing the link between infection and severe illness. 
which is particularly noticeable in older adults and those who are um, more, more at risk of those severe impacts. COVID vaccinations, as colleagues have said, are now being offered to all young people 12 years of age and over. Children who become infected with COVID may experience no symptoms or mild symptoms. However, there are sadly occasional more serious outcomes which vaccination aims to prevent. The purpose of offering vaccination to those 12 years and over is therefore different to vaccinating adults. It is considered to play a role in limiting educational disruption, which has immediate benefits to young people, as well as longer term benefits of being in school, such as to mental health and well-being. In making a decision about whether a young person takes up the offer of vaccination, parents and the young person want to consider the benefits and risks, which others on the panel will pick up in more detail later. If young people take up the offer of vaccination, other measures remain important as part of a layered approach to reducing infection, which we've been working on throughout this pandemic so far, both inside school settings and for individuals and families to consider building into their daily lives. These measures include maintaining good hand washing, regular cleaning, ventilating occupied spaces, thinking about keeping a social distance from people they don't live with, and continued use of face coverings in crowded um, and enclosed spaces. So I'll leave it there in terms of a bit of an overview about where we are in the pandemic, and I'm going to hand over to Jane. Thank you, Claire. Hello, I'm uh, Jane Ansell. I'm the Senior Responsible Officer for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight COVID-19 vaccination programme. Firstly, I'd like to talk about how the programme has been delivered locally to date, and as we continue to work with an army of colleagues, partners and volunteers to ensure that, these, that those most at risk in our communities are protected from the virus. It's nearly 10 months since the COVID-19 vaccination programme was launched across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. And since then, we've vaccinated more than 2.62 million people, um, sorry, vaccines into people. And uh, they've been delivered across our community thanks to the exceptional efforts of everybody involved. We're extremely grateful to everyone who supports the programme locally. Vaccines have been delivered across GP-led uh, vaccination services, hospital hubs, vaccination centres and pharmacy-led services, from festivals to fire stations, circuses to cruise ships and from boxing clubs to places of worship. Countless walk-ins, pop-ins, reach out, re outreach clinics have all been held to support as many eligible people as possible um, to be vaccinated. So who is eligible? People who are eligible to receive the vaccine. Last month, there was new guidance issued by UK government to announce its plans for the next phase of the programme. This forms part of the government's wider winter strategy this year. Those eligible for the vaccine are for people over the age of 16 who are yet to receive a first or second uh, COVID-19 vaccination dose. Um, this continues to the arrangements as promised by the NHS for an evergreen offer. So anybody who hasn't previously had the vaccination or has declined it still has the opportunity to get it. The vaccine is now being offered to school aged children to age 12 and above. What's really important to note is that parental or guardian or carer consent will be sought by vaccination healthcare staff prior to a vaccination of anyone aged 12 to 15. We continue to identify and offer the vaccination to those aged 12 to 15 who either live with somebody who's more likely to get infections or have con conditions that mean they're at high risk from COVID-19. We also continue to identify and offer a third jab to people aged 12 and over who are immunosuppressed and following the updated guidance from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. A booster jab is available to people who have previously received two vaccine doses to ensure that continued protection against the risk is available. The booster is being offered to people in our priority groups one to nine, as identified by the JCVI. National guidance states that the booster should be offered no earlier than six months after the second dose. The NHS will contact people when their time has come to receive their booster vaccination. We continue to work in partnership closely with the uh, um, with our partners to uh, prepare for winter, including the delivery of the next phase of COVID-19 vaccination programme for those who would like to receive the jab and their flu vaccination. The vaccines are not mandatory and we're doing all we can working with our partners to provide the most up-to-date evidence-based information to support eligible people 
to make their own informed decision as to whether to have the COVID-19 and or flu vaccine. Booster vaccinations for 12 to 15 year olds are underway and we are working closely with our partners, including schools, and we're extremely grateful for their support and that all of those of our colleagues and partners and volunteers as, and to ensure that we can um, vaccinate as many eligible people and protect them from the virus. Thank you. I'd now like to hand over to Dr Nigel Watson, our clinical lead. Thank you, Jane. Uh, my name is Nigel Watson. Um, I was a GP in the New Forest for about 30 years and I'm currently the clinical lead for the COVID vaccine programme. So I'd like to thank my colleagues for um, what has been said so far and thank you for joining this uh, webinar, which hopefully will provide you with the information uh, that you need to make uh, the decisions, as Dr Sanderman has said. And I think it's worth reiterating that COVID-19 um, has, hasn't been around for that long. It seems strange that less than two years ago, um, you know, none of us had heard of it. Um, and as clinicians, you know, we're used to dealing with viral infections and, and winter, but nothing could have prepared us for what has happened uh, over the last couple of years. And as Jane and others have said, the COVID vaccination programme has been hugely successful. It's the largest vaccination programme in history and the evidence of its benefit in terms of saving lives, reducing serious infection, reducing the number of admissions to hospital is there for anyone to see. But with all these things, there are difficult decisions to make. So I'd just like to reinforce that COVID-19 is generally a mild infection in children with no symptoms. Currently, about 50% of children who get the infection have no symptoms whatsoever. And when we look at the rates of infection in the community, it has changed over time. So about 50% of the infections currently reported are in the 10 to 19 year age group. And most of the infections are caused by the Delta variant, which Claire referred to, which is significantly more contagious than the previous um, alpha variant or sometimes called the UK variant. So this is not only a nasty virus um, in certain parts of the community, but it is um, easily transmittable and highly infectious. So children that catch COVID can experience the usual symptoms of COVID, which include a high temperature, a cough, a loss of smell or taste, and most of them will be self-limiting and resolve in a few days, or some, as they say, have no symptoms at all. But recent studies have shown that about 2 to 14% of children, so between 1 in 20 and 1 in 7, um, when they contract COVID, will still have some symptoms more than 15 weeks later. And this is what we call long COVID. So um, we are seeing it in children. So for some people, there is a more significant impact on their health. And rarely, and I repeat rarely, some children develop more serious symptoms and require hospital treatment. And as uh, Dr Sanderman says, you know, if you look in absolute numbers, this occurs in about 90 children per million. So it is rare, but it does happen. And the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunisation, which is a body that advises government, looked at the evidence of COVID vaccination recently and balanced up the risks of the vaccination against the benefits. And their assessment of the benefits for the individual child were marginal. And that's why they didn't come to a decision, as they have done with other groups, to recommend to government that they we should proceed with vaccination. What they did suggest was they didn't look at some of the, it was not in their remit to look at some of the wider implications of the impact on schooling, on the mental uh, health and wellbeing of children missing schooling and of long COVID. And therefore they deferred the decision for the chief medical officers of the four nations to balance up the all of the evidence to make that decision. And as we know, the decision that they came to was that we should be offering the COVID vaccination to children aged 12 and above who are fit and well. And we are offering the Pfizer vaccine because that is the only COVID vaccine that is licensed to be used in um, children between the age of 12 and 15. None of the other vaccines are currently licensed to be used in children. So normally in the adult population, we would give two doses spaced apart by at least eight weeks 
And the reason for the second dose is the first dose will confer a degree of immunity, but we then give a second dose to boost that immunity and give more prolonged immunity. The reason in children we're currently only offering one vaccine is because the um, risks against the benefits, when we look at it, research has shown that very rarely, and I repeat the word very rarely, you can get an inflammation of the heart muscle called myocarditis following the vaccination. Now this occurs more commonly in boys than in girls and is more common after the second dose of the vaccine um, rather than the first dose. So hence the reason why uh, a single vaccine is being offered at this time. Although we should note that many countries started vaccinating children aged 12 to 15 earlier in the summer um, and many countries in Europe are doing this and the USA and they are actually using two doses of vaccine to give better protection. Currently what we would do is offer a single dose of Pfizer but actually continue to look at the evidence from uh, not only the UK but around the world as this program is ever evolving and developing with the uh, initial aim to save as many lives as possible but also to try and reduce the transmission and reduce the risk to our whole population. We have been asked in the programme a number of times about the vaccine and would the vaccinating children particularly um, cause them to be infected with um, the COVID virus or would it affect the testing? And just to be clear, as Dr Sanderman says, the Pfizer vaccine is based on the COVID-19 genetic code. And when you inject this into the body, it enters a cell and produces what's called a spike protein. The body then produces antibodies to that protein and those antibodies remain uh, present so that if you then get exposed to the COVID uh, virus, then those antibodies will attack and neutralize the virus. But it doesn't give you 100% protection. It gives you um, a degree of protection and it varies depending on the age and people's uh, own body in terms of how they respond to it. And I once heard it described that the, the vaccine, particularly the Pfizer vaccine, is a bit like a Snapchat message, that it is time limited. It is not an active virus, so you certainly can't catch COVID from the vaccine. Um, the vaccine is not a live virus and therefore that's how it gives you protection. So in summary, you know, when we look at vaccinations and this goes for all vaccinations, whether they're um, the children's vaccinations we give, travel vaccinations, they are a great success story in the uh, world in terms of protecting us against infectious diseases. But they all vaccines have a degree of risk and we have to balance up the risks against the benefits. So hopefully today we've given you some um, information that will allow you to come to that decision uh, with your family and children about proceeding uh, with the vaccination, protect your children, but also to protect other family members and particularly those who are more vulnerable. Um, and I will now hand over to Sarah uh, to talk about the delivery of the vaccination programme to children. No, I'm oh, sorry to interject there. Um, Sarah, apologies, but did you start? My name's Claire Sedgwick, I'm Associate Director of Communications at the local NHS Commission. Um, we've had a lot of questions around consent, inevitably, parental and guardian consent, and that of young people as well in um, making their decision whether or not to take up the offer of a COVID vaccine. Could you just possibly update us on, on how that actually works in practice? So. If a young person is in a school and doesn't consent to having the vaccine, what happens next? So the, the whole consenting process has been well worked through and can seem somewhat complex, but, but we, you, you can only vaccinate somebody if you have their informed consent. So essentially we'll be um, sending uh, information and consent forms to parents for them to um, get the information and make an informed decision. If a child turns up to um, the clinic that they've been invited into and they consent to the vaccine and the parents have consented, then we'll proceed and vaccinate them. If the child refuses to be vaccinated and they're deemed to be competent, which I will come back to, 
we can't vaccinate them even if the parent has consented because that would be considered assault. If the parent has declined the vaccine, but the child says, I want to be vaccinated, then we again get into the um, discussion about Gillick competence. And what we would do locally is we would take the views of the parent, but also the views of the child. Now, in a busy clinic where we're vaccinating hundreds of people, that is not the appropriate place to have that discussion or to vaccinate that child. So we do have people with um, great expertise in the school age immunisation service who would then um, look at those children and their parents and work through with them so that they can come to an informed decision. So we wouldn't be vaccinating people against the parents' um, consent at that point in time. And we would obviously take on board what the children, um, their children's view as well. Just to be clear, the Gillick competence is a legal definition which came through following a legal case many years ago, which says that although um, you know, we look at 16 as the age of consent, children under that age do, if they are deemed to be able to assess the information and make a decision for themselves, that they could be deemed competent to make those decisions. So we get into sort of complex legal area and therefore in this program, what we've tried to do is to ensure that we've covered that. So not only parents have confidence in the program, but also have confidence in the process. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thanks, and I'll pass on to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Sarah Malcolm. I'm the business director for NHS Solent. So we have two community providers um, across Hampshire and Isle of Wight that run our usual um, school age immunisation services. That's Southern Health um, for the Hampshire area and NHS Solent who, who cover Portsmouth, Southampton and the Isle of Wight. Um, we've got really tried and tested models for delivering vaccinations in schools and a real history um, of running successful programmes, which is why the school age immunisation service have been asked to roll out the COVID vaccination um, programme and offer a vaccination to all schools in the Hampshire and Isle of Wight uh, area. This covers uh, not just our traditional state schools, but we're also offering the vaccination to our home educated communities, um, to those in private schools, um, to our special needs schools where our vulnerable children um, are often um, uh, educated, and also those in detained facilities. So everyone aged 12 and above will be able to access a COVID vaccination um, if they choose to. Where we can, our model of delivery um, is to offer both COVID and flu vaccine together in schools. Um, this isn't always possible, but our ambition is to do that wherever we can to reduce the amount of time that children are out of education. So I thought it might be helpful um, just to describe the service that we're running and what your young person um, will see if they choose to get their COVID vaccination in school. So we bring a fairly large experienced team um, into each individual school. We always have two clinical leads with us um, for each session who are really experienced. One um, working uh, experience of working in schools um, and dealing with young people and some of the um, complexities that that brings. And another who's really experienced in delivering the COVID vaccination. Our teams comprise um, of clinical, what we call registrants, so often nurses, doctors, pharmacists, therapists, um, but we also bring um, a team of vaccinators and administrators. All of those teams will have the relevant skills, experience um, and qualifications for working in schools, as well as ensuring that they've all met the enhanced um, DBS checks around security. For children who may be absent from school um, or unable to take the vaccine, um, particularly if they've had a COVID diagnosis within the last 28 days, we will be offering follow up sessions as part of the programme. Um, those will either be delivered um, in schools or at our mass vaccination centres, community facilities or potentially in primary care. Um, parents may be able to bring their children along to those sessions and we will have a similar staffing mix at each of those um, sessions where we will work with our schools and our local authorities to arrange those and to make them as accessible as possible. So the model of delivery um, changes in each school, um, particularly due to the space that the school have available, the number of children to vaccinate um, and the number of staff that we're able to bring in. But in general, our model is that we aim to review the consent forms that you as parents um, or those with parental responsibility will have completed and sent into um, the school. 
We come out and do a school visit where possible um, just to review the premises and to understand um, any uh, implications that we may need to work through. At that time, we may need to ring some of the parents up if we've got any queries with any information um, on the forms or if there's any contraindications or special requirements that we may need to consider to individualise that for your child. On the day of the clinic, um, we ask the young person um, to be brought into the vaccination area by a member of the school team, so it's somebody that they're familiar with. They will be met by one of our um, wonderful administration staff. They'll check their details and consent forms, and they'll ask them to wear a face covering as they're coming into a clinical area. They'll have a really short clinical assessment prior to the vaccination, just to go through the consent questions again and check that everybody's happy um, and comfortable with having the vaccination. Once they've had that, they'll need to sit and wait for 15 minutes afterwards um, and be observed in the same way that we do with all people having access to a Pfizer vaccination. It's a really quick process and it usually takes just under five minutes um, for the young people to go through uh, the vaccination. The team that we bring in, as I've said, are really experienced in dealing with um, school children, particularly with anybody who's um, nervous or needle phobic um, or any other issues that, they, that may arise on the day. We always have privacy booths or areas available um, for anybody who needs them, particularly um, if the school uniform appears to be quite restrictive. We do ask children um, to come in a PE kit or into short sleeve shirts if possible, um, and we will always individualise the vaccination to suit the needs of the young person. So, so far, we've already adapted the service over the few weeks that we've been delivering. Um, we've allowed people to have the vaccination with their friends if they've needed to, um, for a bit of moral support, to have it lying down um, where they've uh, felt more comfortable. We often hold hands um, if needed, and we've even had some of our staff sing to some of our teams, uh, to some of our young people, just to distract them. Um, and we've had a 100% success rate with our nervous um, young people so far. So the schools have been really great. Um, the young people have been very enthusiastic and encouraging their nervous friends to come forward. And many of them have been extremely grateful to receive the vaccination. Thank you. Um, I'll hand over to Alison now. Thanks, Sarah. Your description of looking after the needle phobic made me smile. My 17 year old had her vaccine and was also very, very anxious and the team, team were very kind. Um, I'm Alison Critchley. Uh, I work in the education department in Portsmouth City Council um, and I've been working with our schools um, and health colleagues over the last 18 months um, to try to support schools and children and families um, through through the pandemic, um, help them with the advice that's come from guide from government about minimising um, infection in schools and trying to keep things as normal as possible for children and families. Obviously, it's not been possible to do that. There has been massive disruption um, to children's education over the last 18 months and not just their education, but all of the things that go go along alongside that um, proms that have been missed, school journeys, all of those things that our, that our children need and help them to, to grow into young adults and young people. Um, and therefore, for, for me and for colleagues in education, I think there is very much the hope that the vaccine um, being taken up by parents who choose to do that will be one of our ways to minimise disruption going forward. As colleagues have talked about, um, COVID hasn't gone away. Um, actually, infection levels are as, as high as they have been in the past, but that is now very much concentrated amongst school age young people who haven't had the opportunity for the vaccine. Sorry, Nigel, did you want to come in? No, finish off, please. I'll just come in at um, the end. So, um, so yes, very, very much, very, pre still very prevalent um, in schools, um, and therefore the opportunity to have the vaccine for parents who want to take that up for that for the young person, um, and also the use of lateral flow tests, which, as people have talked about, very often children and young people have very mild symptoms or no symptoms at all, are really important things that we can do um, to make sure that the cohort of children who are who are still in school now don't have that significant disruption, are able to do those milestone things. Uh, and, and therefore we do see this very much as, as an important an important offer. Um, and almost I know some of the schools we work with, you know, there's been a frustration that parents haven't had the opportunity to get their 12 to 15 year olds uh, have the opportunity for the vaccine up until now. Um, so we're very keen that all of those who want to take it up can, can do that and are working closely with, with schools, with vaccination teams um, to make sure that that offer is available.
Nigel. Yeah, I, I'd just like to build on what you said actually for a wider point, which is, um, you know, when we look at um, the uptake, if you take people over 80, for example, we've got about 94% of people vaccinated. As we go down the age groups, it, it is less. It is particularly important. Some of the people listening to this will probably be in the 18 to 40 year old age group where we've got about 75% uptake. And I would just encourage people to think about their own individual risk. And certainly what has been, you know, early on in um, the COVID pandemic, we were admitting people to hospital who were um, elderly, who were more at risk. But as the vaccination programme is protecting those, disproportionately now we see people being admitted to hospital who are under 40. Um, so this isn't just, although we're focusing on Children's Day, which is really important, I would just ask people who aren't vaccinated to think about themselves um, and get themselves protected. Because as we said earlier, in anything or most things in life, there are risks and benefits. And certainly for the vaccine programme, the benefits outweigh the risks. So I would just encourage adults who haven't currently been vaccinated to come forward. As Jane and others have said earlier, the offer is still open for those who declined it early on for various reasons, but the evidence is overwhelming for the benefits for all our adult population. Thank you. So if I can now hand back to Helen. Thank you, Alison. So uh, the webinar is now at close, uh, but we would like to signpost you to some additional information which is available online and an email address which you can use to send in your questions. Uh, thank you very much for listening today. Um, we hope that we have provided you with some useful information to support your thinking and to help with your decision making on vaccination. Thanks go to our panellists uh, for generously sharing their expertise and to all of the teams and people working to support the vaccination programme, which is uh, an immense amount of work and a huge amount of commitment. Finally, our huge thanks go to you, our parents, guardians and carers of our children, young people. Thank you.